Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, welcome to Thursday Eco Eats. I'm just gonna give everyone a few minutes to uh, file in, especially you know in case there's technical difficulties or anything like that. So uh, stay tuned. All right, everyone, let's get started. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. This is day four of our Earth Week celebrations. Um, so this is again brought to you by the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, Marine Science Graduate Student Organization's Sustainability Initiative. <laughs> That's a mouthful and I'm sort of getting the hang of it, but uh, yeah, a lot of us are really passionate about sustainability, especially how it interacts with science and our daily lives. Um, and so we wanted to bring an awesome community event together for Earth Week, regardless of the current situation we're in. So that's why we're all in Zoom. Uh, but uh, I want to remind everyone this is a positive community experience, right? So this is a no troll zone and anybody who does not abide by uh, the respectful positive community experience will be dismissed without warning. Um, 
So today for our Eco Eat series, we are talking about diversity in the environment. And I'm really excited about this. We have two speakers. One is AJ Hudson. The second is Teresa Pinto. And so our first speaker is AJ. He is a first year PhD student with Catherine Mock. And I will let him take it away from here. AJ. Oh, mute. <laughs> I still don't know how to use Zoom. It's funny. You'd think that I'd learn after this month or so. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is AJ Hudson. I'm a first year PhD student at the Abbas Center. Uh, and my research is really interdisciplinary. It's split between CMS, uh, working with Catherine Mock, and the School of Education, their community and social change program, working with Scott Evans. Um, and I would love to kind of lead us off on a bit of a discussion and tell a little bit of story to kind of get people's thoughts uh, churning. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. There we go. Cool. So um, as usual, oh, this is presenter view. Of course it is. There we go. So as usual, I prepared way too much stuff. So I'm just gonna try and get through some of the things that I thought would be interesting. The topics I wanted to really broach today were issues of diversity, complicity, and what climate justice means. Um, and like, I don't mind being interrupted. I'm trying not to be the typical academic. Uh, don't be crazy, but like, if you would, if you really want to say something, feel free to raise your hand and, uh, or turn on your mic and just ask for a question, ask me to slow down. So a little bit about me. Um, I actually uh, was a teacher for several years after graduating from college. I taught for five years environmental science and biology as a basic biologist, really, um, who had had a lot of training in social sciences too. Uh, but more or less, environmental circumstances in my school led me to wanting to pursue further education. Uh, so I went to go and get my master's degree in environmental science to see if academia was right for me. And I told myself if it went well, I'd apply for PhD programs. So here I am. Um, Long story short, my school that I taught at in Brooklyn, my high school, had uh, horrific lead poisoning. Um, and this is a public high school in a pretty mainstream central part of Brooklyn. Uh, I think a lot, when it comes to environmental justice, a lot of people don't realize how normal these issues are. It's not just Flint. Sometimes stuff makes the news, but environmental justice concerns are like pervasive all the time everywhere. So um, let's see. I wanted to kind of like get the basics down and like kind of what the assumptions are of what I study with climate justice. Uh, so I like to take a temporal viewpoint when it comes to climate justice. Um, and this is something I'm happy to talk more about with anyone. Uh, but basically there's a couple assumptions and I wanted to get these out of the way uh, so that people can kind of know what my perspective is before I start talking about diversity. So wealthy and white countries for the most part caused climate change effectively. And they also, this is the important part when it comes to justice, profited the most from the burning of the fossil fuels that led to the emissions. These are things that we don't normally talk about when we talk about carbon uh, dioxide, right? We kind of reduce the issue to just a chemical issue. But this is an important tenet of climate justice. Um, the second part, and this isn't in the past, this is more in the present. People of color and the poor people of the world do not have a seat at the table in the current climate change conversations, treaties, negotiations. Uh, within, within countries, it's mostly the wealthy that lead and it's mostly people who don't have to deal with living next to petroleum plants or who have to deal with uh, their homes being flooded and heat stroke and all these other things that climate is going to bring, all the impacts climate is going to bring. These people who are making the decisions for the most part are not the people who are facing the consequences. So that's like the issue of the present tension. And then 
The third one, which is also true right now, right? All of these kind of, it's like these, these temporal points blend. They're not clear divisions. Uh, is that people of color and the world's poor will actually face the majority of climate change consequences. Uh, and that's true right now already. So um, I was gonna go over ground rules and norms, but you know we're not participating as much as usual, but we're still gonna participate. So I would like to go over some. Uh, I guess I would say really important during these conversations is to recognize who you are. And uh, if you have a problem with an idea, then like dismantle that idea, don't attack people. Um, and also I would love it if I heard some other voices to some of these questions, um, but make sure you're, if you're talking 25 times during the hour that we've talked today, you're probably talking too much and you should like, you know, um, and if you don't speak or write or annotate even once, then maybe you should try and step up a little bit. So I wanted to start with this little uh, comic. So uh, I think this is more relevant than ever you see the earth walking out of a nurse's office, right? And uh, Jupiter, big mom Jupiter says, now, now children, now, now. And you see she's chastising the children because they're singing, earth has people, earth has people. Um, and I kind of want to ask, you know, what, what does this mean? What's the joke here? Why is it funny? It's connected a lot to the work that I do and the work that I'm looking into but I kind of want to give people an opportunity. What makes this funny? What's, what's actually the joke here? Let's see. And I should have told people I have this prepared for later. Uh, we have the Q and A, but also annotations. I would like people to try and annotate. Um, we have some great, we have some great answers coming in into the chat. Ah, the attendees can't speak. I'm so sorry, everybody. Um, so, but can people annotate though? Can we try that? Um, yeah, unfortunately due to the webinar security features, the attendees are not allowed to annotate. Uh, to avoid trolling, okay. That's yes. okay. okay. So if you cool. guys want to answer in the Q&A, that's probably the best way we can go about this. That's fine then. Then I'll turn off the teacher a little bit and I'll just talk a little bit more and I'll keep my chat open and make sure to check on you guys. I'm not used to having such a like, you know, I get to speak and no one interrupts me. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, we had one person say humans can be compared to a parasite. Yeah, absolutely. I'm thinking a very particular type of parasite nowadays, right? Uh, has anyone else been seeing the memes? What meme does this remind you of? This is from, this comic's from like 10 years ago, but what meme does it remind you of today? Good, Megan says humans are like cooties. Yes. I heard someone say it. Who else has seen the we are the virus memes that are going around? Some of them are quite funny. I saw Lisa Frank dolphins swimming in a river and people said the Hudson River has come back to life. We are the virus. Uh, now these memes are funny, but they're tapping into a deeper issue, which is kind of central to some of the diversity issues that I see within uh, within the climate change conversation and within environmentalism in general. So this is a funny uh, comic at first glance, but there's like some deeper meanings and deeper issues, right? Now there's, there's problems with saying that people are a virus. Uh, and there's also problems with looking at the step back in personal emissions right now that's happening due to coronavirus and acting as if all the death and chaos that's happening right now is a solution to climate change. Um, but one of the things I wanted to get into with this is that there's a, there's a serious issue 
with acting as if people uh, unanimously are a virus and not cultural tendencies and systems that we've built are a problem that's destroying the planet. Particularly when the average person does not have as much control as say Jeff Bezos um, or even a Bill Gates, right? Not to mention the more or less leading bureaucrat class in our, in our nation. Think about the average person. Is it really fair to call the average person in the United States, nonetheless the average person in the global South who may be impoverished uh, and living in a rural area with a very small carbon footprint, is it fair to call that person the virus? When we say that humanity itself is a parasite, what are we blurring and what are we erasing? We're basically erasing the unequal share that we've had in creating this problem and the unequal share we have in solving this problem. Uh, so I wanted to kind of address that and kind of warm up our heads to like the kind of uh, deeper perspectives we're going to be getting into today. Let's see, it's my time check. Okay, 1217, cool. So um, I'm going to tell a bit of a story now. So um, this right here is pretty fundamental and it's, it's interesting. Uh, we don't realize necessarily the ways in which we're all connected. So Rasmus is uh, more or less the environmental school of the University of Miami, right? And so this is actually a photo from uh, the environmental school of uh, Yale, Yale University, one of the oldest universities in our country. Um, and I went to Yale for my master's degree. And a lot of the hardship that I encountered at Yale around these topics is what really inspired me to continue to study and pursue them. This is a picture from the class of 1901. Uh, what do we notice in this photo? What are noticings we have? I keep switching to the next one. Yeah, not much is spoiled though. Um, let's see. Go ahead and answer in the chat if you can. Anything that people notice from this photo? Uh, this is the class of 1901. The first people to basically graduate with more or less an MPS degree, Master of Environmental Management and Forest Resource Management. Cool. Okay. They're all men we have and that they're all white. What about age? Is, it, is the age spread about the same? More or less, right? If we had to guess at the wealth status of these people in this image, what might we guess considering it's 1900 at Yale University? Very, very wealthy. Uh, many of these people are family friends of the same dude who helped found our national parks. None other than Teddy himself, right? The original Teddy Bear, Teddy Roosevelt. So. These are all people from the upper socioeconomic class, good. So we go forward 30 years in the school's history and it's grown. Um, it's like, so I like to ask the questions of like, what changes, what's changed, what hasn't changed? We notice anything that's changed? More men, yeah. More people, it's larger, yeah. There's actually some, uh, a bit of like, I guess you could call it veiled diversity in a sense in this photo too. Um, this is one of the first class where there was actually two Jewish students and also uh, a few students from Europe, like directly from Europe as like international students. So uh, there, there's a bit of like veiled diversity hidden within um, what comes off as sameness, right? Because there's not too much visual diversity. Um, so I, I found this kind of interesting. And I wanted to say that basically until like the 70s, this stayed the same. 
these photos look exactly the same. I was actually going to download a bunch of them from the L archive and upload them, and they stayed the same. Um, and, and so I kind of wanted to ask people, you know, how do these photos make you feel? What do they make you think about Rasmus? What do they make you think about education in general? I want people, I know you don't have a chance to talk back to me, which I'm like sad about, but what do they make you think about environmentalism, about your own experience with environmentalism and about even why you're in this chat today? Okay. So go ahead and answer in the chat if you can, even as I move forward. Um, I love seeing what you guys are writing. So something changed uh, in like 1970, basically. Uh, there was the first uh, black student, a student from Africa, the first black identifying student. Um, an international student from Africa was actually in the class, um, as well as a black student from the United States. There was also Asian identifying students and several women. Something like this might not be as well archived at our school and at other schools, uh, because not every school is as obsessed with its personal history, but these documents can really serve to show us in a certain sense who environmentalism is for, uh, how it's expanded in ways that it hasn't. So we're zooming out even further, or, or uh, I guess getting closer to our own time. This is a class of 2000. Oh, no worries about it. <laughs> Uh, this is a class of 2000. You can see the class has grown much larger and uh, I didn't actually count, but it seems like the split of gender is almost even visually at least. Um, and according to like records at, at this point, this is when some of the classes of the environmental school started being actually predominantly women identifying. So now we're really close to history, or sorry, to the present. Uh, we're at the class of, what is this, 2016? Yeah, no, 2017. So this is interesting. This is actually, oops, I don't know how to go back now. Darn it. I don't know how to go back, sorry guys. Let's see. There you go. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is a class of 2017 and it's actually the last class effectively to be uh, to be featured on the website and in the archives. You won't find my class here in the archive. Um, and one of the reasons why, yeah, I know these doggies are super cute. <laughs> Uh, I want us to say like, you know, this, this is a, a modern photo, right? And I think we're more forgiving to ourselves nowadays in modern times. And it's, uh, how, how, how have we grown as an environmental movement? If we look at this class as a microcosm, students deciding to get a master's in environmental science, how, how have we grown? Who, who are we? How have we changed? Um, and this is, like I said, the last photo you'll find up there because things got political. People started protesting these photos. And I kind of want to ask people, like, how do they think they would have ended up? What side do they think they would have ended up on? And what does that mean? So um, due to a certain group of activists, uh, this is this photo kind of gets rid of my plausible deniability, so I should probably not be showing it. Um, basically, a movement was started to protest these photos. 
a movement was started to uh, make, make them stand for something, make them more political. Students in uh, the 70s and revolving around Rachel Carson's famous work, Silent Spring, got to be really political and, and fight against toxics. And so we kind of thought, you know, why can't students fight against climate change in similar ways? Why can't people fight against, uh, you know, complicity and Yale's endowment, investing in fossil fuels? And uh, we decided to hold up banners in the photos. And these are the banners. One says Yale is complicit, climate justice now. And the other one basically says, uh, center the struggle of people of color in the environmental movement. Our school really, really struggled, um, in some ways much more than Rasmus does, to include narratives and uh, the struggle of people of color within environmental conversations, to include those concerns and to include topics like environmental justice as courses. So uh, these photos led to us using the banners and we told everyone we would uh, and that we would have a group of people at the front who wanted to hold up the banners. And there was a big split. Peop there is, there is, I'll say there's about like five people who had nothing to do with making the banners who asked if they could join. And we said, absolutely, anyone who wants to hold the banner can join. But then the remaining people there was a big split between who wanted to have absolutely no banners in the photo and who wanted to have the banners in the photo. And so it was really an interesting issue of people feeling like they didn't want to make a political statement. They didn't want to make this photo political. They just wanted to have a class photo. They didn't want to have a political image uh, attached to them. And so I would kind of like to ask, you know, I know we can't vote in the way that I was hoping to because we can't do polls, um, but which side of this fight would you have landed on and why? And feel free to ask more like clarifying questions at this point too. Would you have been with the no banner side or the banner side? Would you have been with the, this image shouldn't be political or this image should be political? And I'm not necessarily asking if you agree with what the signs say, I'm asking if you agree whether the signs should be there, if this is a place they should be. Um, and then this photo will be hung in Yale's halls, right? And anyone who walks in will see you there behind this sign, theoretically. Even though these ones, this photo never actually made it up onto uh, the Yale archive. It's not there yet. It's only been like a year, so. We have one person who said banners. We have some great comments from, uh, let's see, Megan, still an issue, yep, okay. Amelia says banners, even if it's a controversial photo, it's starting a conversation. Okay. So, one of the central things that uh, kept coming up in this conversation and became very vitriolic was that people didn't want the photo to be political, that it was supposed to be a celebratory, uh, happy thing, and that politics was mucking things up and kind of ruining it. Um, now, needless to say, I find protesting problems and like having a voice to be joyous for me, but I can understand that maybe not everyone finds politics to be something that's joyful or celebratory. Uh, but what my big contention is, and this is something that I would like to kind of take home as my, my message, is that the photos were always political. If we look back at the older photos, there was always a political statement around who Yale as an institution was, who environmentalism was, what Yale stood for, what environmentalism stood for, who was allowed to get a master's degree in environmentalism, who was allowed to have a seat at the table when it came to environmental management. 
all of these questions were answered very clearly and in some ways still are by the images we see in these photos. And it doesn't take a banner for us to be politically affirming. Now, really what people meant when they said these photos were too political was that the, they were breaking the status quo. They thought that this was something that was upsetting what, what they considered normal and neutral. And that's really what I'm hoping for us to examine today. When we think about diversity, when we think back on who we are and how much the academy has grown and how little it hasn't, I want us to think about the ways in which not only are we, are we complicit, but in which our idea of normal and what is normal versus what's rabble rousing, annoying, conflict, politics, upsetting, what is normal versus what is political and how that defines change and what's allowed to change. Because if you're going to say that the protest photo with a group of majority people of color holding up a banner is political, then you're going to say that what's normal and right and justified without even meaning to say what you're saying is that those photos that were completely exclusionary without any one of them, that that was the norm. And so I want us to try and question and even think and kind of hold ourselves accountable in our language as to what we consider political and what we consider apolitical. As scientists, we often like to tell ourselves our work is apolitical. But I think that these conversations and things that happen in our community, like this story, reveal to us that apolitical, neutral things typically are just normative. And that just means business as usual. So let's see, we have a couple people saying no banners, people worried about endorsement, that came up for sure. Um, great way to show people of color are still facing problems in different ways. Good, good, see, okay, cool. Thank, thank you uh, for those of you putting your answers in here. This is great. Originally, I was going to have people just write straight onto the slides so that people could type out some answers, but you know, we're being flexible. Um, okay, let's see. Yeah, uh, I want to make sure I save some time for Teresa, uh, as well as like any like questions at the end. So um, I'm going to give people a chance to ask any like questions about the stuff that I just talked about before, you know, in my perspective before I kind of hand over the mic. I do also want to make it clear that um, I don't think that people not wanting the banners is like some wrong, horrible, complicit thing. I just want to question how this issue comes up of what is political and what's not political. And uh, basically, this diversity talk, in a sense, I hope can serve as a reminder that for many people, there's not a, we don't have a privilege of being apolitical because we're not represented in the academy. People who are lower income, people of color, people uh, who are queer don't necessarily have the same privilege around keeping things normal, calm, keeping things as they were and not upsetting. And so it is a privilege in a certain way to see things as apolitical. Uh, to be able to look back at the old photos without banners and see those as not being political statements too. So it's just something to question, something to think about, something to really probe ourselves with. Uh, and, and then, you know, not to be incriminating, but to say whether you want banners or not, to think about what that would mean for how you move through this world and how you move through environmentalism. AJ, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah, so, I feel like, especially from a scientist's perspective, you might get this feedback and I'm curious how you respond to scientists in particular saying, oh, well, I don't wanna be political because I wanna to stick to the science. I don't wanna lose my credibility. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely have heard this before. Um, I mean, I think there's two quick answers. I think one, it's a little bit too late for that. 
uh, in this current era where science has become politicized, while scientists have erred on the side of least drama, I think it's a bit too late for people to say they don't want to be political. Um, and then the other thing is I'd call to attention the fact that science has always been political. It evolved as a, a hobby for rich people, for people who weren't quite rich enough to be nobles, uh, for the sons who didn't inherit the property, but their parents had enough money to send them to Cambridge, right? Science has always been a political act. It's always been a political act to be able to examine the world. It's always been a political act to say that there's objective truth. And again, I would say anyone who's saying they don't want to be political, what they really mean is that they don't want to make a ruckus. They don't want to make too much noise. Uh, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. I think it's okay for you to say like, I don't want to make too much noise. I don't want people to think I'm an activist because then people won't take me as seriously, right? But even that is a political statement, right? Even that is saying like, well, what matters more to me is that people take me seriously than that I give an impassioned speech about why the environment matters, et cetera. Um, and I would also say that I always challenge people to look at whether they're truly political or apolitical, even from their own framework. Because I find that people often who say that as scientists, they don't want to take a stand, will be comfortable taking a stand on plastic straws, but maybe not taking a stand on poverty. And so there's some issues in our country again, which really upset what's the norm, what has been longstanding history, uh, which the banners are a micro metaphor for that, right? And then there's other issues which don't necessarily get at those root causes. And I think that often we are more comfortable as scientists being political about those things that don't get at the root causes than things that actually start to question the very basis of the academy. Because the academy has been an unequal place for I mean, millennia at this point. Right, that's a very, very interesting perspective. And um, I think we will pass it over to Teresa, but AJ, that was fantastic. And I hope that is really uh, opening up everyone's eyes who has attended or appreciates the perspective that we've been given today. I know I have, um, so thank you, AJ. Of course. Feel free to email me anyone if you want to talk about this further. I know people might have felt they couldn't express their ideas as much through the chat, you know, tech limitations. But thank everyone for thank you to everyone for participating. Yeah, unfortunately, because of I feel like maybe you guys have heard of the Zoom bombings happening. And uh, so especially when we're having conversations about diversity and climate change, we do have to err on the side of caution. So hopefully, you know, uh, being educated and being aware of topics uh, such as these will help limit those and maybe we can interact further in the future. Um, so with that being said, we're going to move on to our next speaker, uh, Teresa. So she is a also a, she has a doctor and a law degree, I believe. So, but I'll let her uh, explain it from here. Teresa? Um, hi, thanks, Kayla. Um, so I just want to uh, thank um, the Rasmus uh, Graduate Sustainability Group for inviting me to talk. Um, and um, just a brief introduction, I am a scientist. And um, in answer to AJ's question, I have uh, become political in a sense, and I have moved beyond the silos of um, academic science. Um, I was in a PhD program at Berkeley many, many years ago, um, and then I left. Um, looking to kind of do something a little bit more um, uh, direct and a little bit more actionable within the community, right? So um, I started a family and then um, uh, in 2016, there was, a, there was an awful election. And um, then I got involved in the March for Science Miami and we kind of uh, protested what was going on, uh, seeing a lack of evidence-based policymaking and um, scientific kind of evidence informing what's going on. Um, and then I decided that law school would be a great way to kind of uh, put all of this stuff into practice. So um, what does that mean though? And what does uh, intersectionality kind of mean, which is kind of what I called my, uh, my topic, but um, I'm just gonna share my screen now to kind of go into some of that. Um, and like AJ, if you want to type in any questions or anything along the way, I'm happy to try and answer them. Um, and let me just see 
if this will work. Okay. And then I think I need to start my slideshow. Okay, so what, what I don't really do research, right? Because um, lawyering, if you know, is really more about practice, right? Um, so what am I doing? Um, I'm kind of working in environmental justice and AJ talked a little bit about that, right? And what, um, and then what is this intersectionality, right? In environmental justice. Um, so intersectionality though was coined in 1989 by a UCLA law professor. Her name was Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. Um, and it was kind of, um, she, was, she was developing the idea um, that feminism, it, it was kind of like second wave feminism in a sense, first wave feminism uh, felt too um, mono, monotone in a sense, that like one voice was only being heard. So her, her idea of intersectionality was to bring more voices into um, feminism in a sense. And she called this intersectionality, recognizing that there's overlapping identities um, that, that are in every person, right? Like, so uh, my identity is not just as an Asian woman, um, right? It's got all these overlapping identities. Um, so, it, but for me that it, you can expand that to, to the ecosystem. You can expand that to the environment, right? Um, you can look at, it as the natural diversity that's kind of built into our evolutionary process, right, of life. Um, um, it can be listening to more than one voice as illustrated in um, Chimananda Ngozi Adichie's Danger of a Single Story, which if you haven't already heard that TED talk, it's amazing. Um, so in my mind, um, as, a, as a scientist, once I was given, I saw someone answered in the Q&A, like, how can you convince scientists that um, these problems are real and that there's a connection and they said facts and I and that's basically what happened right I just as a scientist was observing the world around me um, seeing lots of kind of environmental problems and and social problems um, and seeing them connected in many ways and the evidence kind of showing that they are connected right um, so uh, a single story in my mind right when things aren't intersectional always leads to injustice right and that's kind of what I was observing so um, AJ told uh, his uh, great story and I wanna start my story or this story of intersectionality and environmental justice here um, with Florida, right? So there are 67, we're here in Florida right now. Um, we're um, sometimes called ground zero for sea level rise and climate change, right? Um, in Florida, there are 67 counties, right? And the first was Escambia up here um, on the westernmost uh, tip of the panhandle in 1821, right? Uh, uh, the next year, Jackson County was uh, formed, um, named after uh, Andrew Jackson, uh, seventh president of our United States. Um, also probably famed or known for being, um, uh, a, 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 I guess, genocide on uh, Native American populations, right? So he was the president that signed the Indian Removal Act um, into uh, law. Um, he, as a military general, he performed lots of raids into Florida with the purpose of uh, both beating back the Spanish and, um, and uh, ridding, uh, ridding the land of Native Americans and taking it over. Then he served as the first military governor, right? So what is this about? All of this is to kind of say that uh, Florida, like the rest of the United States, um, was formed out of colonization development. Um, it was basically developed by people, you know, uh, over the entire state, all of these counties, the majority of them are named after racist pretty much, right? So, um, and by this I mean that uh, the names on here of all these people, most of these people either own slaves or were part of like colonization of land um, or fought on the wrong side of the Civil War, uh, things like that, right? Um, so, and this includes Andrew Jackson, who Anthony Wallace writes in um, his book, The Long Bitter Trail, um, that Jacksonian democracy was about the extension of white supremacy across the North American continent, right? Um, and this goes hand in hand then with the development of that land and the environmental policy that went along with that um, colonization and development across the land, right? So all of this stuff, throughout history, as AJ pointed out, is really tied together, right? And then you throw in people who believe that they have rightful dominion over nature, um, those who would pursue economic dominion over nature and people, right? And that's basically all of the counties. All of the counties are named for that. 
Um, so it's a familiar story in a sense, right? Um, but uh, so that's kind of where environmental justice for me comes in. It is um, at the intersection of like civil rights law, um, environmental law, um, administrative law, which is uh, to many people mostly uh, kind of wonky and boring, but um, if you didn't know this, I think 80% of our rules and laws today um, are made through an administrative law process, right? So we can talk a little bit more about that. But um, so environmental justice, this is the definition that is um, put on our government websites, right? And so I just want you to take a moment to like look at this and think about whether this addresses kind of that history of human development um, subordination, which is very, um, as a legal term kind of used under the Equal Protection Clause uh, to talk about how things have been discriminated against. But if you broaden that again to ecosystems, um, it seems like a lot of the environmental degradation, a lot of the social injustices are about a single story, um, but also um, it's also about subordination, right? So maybe that single story subordinating all the other stories. So this definition, I think, is good. Um, in 1994, uh, Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton actually passed an executive order saying that all agencies and departments do have to consider environmental justice in their um, rulemaking. But I just want to also um, say that this also focuses more on um, meaningful involvement which is about public participation, right? And public participation is very important um, in our rulemaking, um, or so the government kind of says. And I think sometimes they use those words to trick us into thinking that they're giving us voice and letting our stories be heard when they're not. Um, but to move on, I think it's a good starting point for environmental justice work. And so what does this mean in practice, right? Um, so environmental, South Florida, is home to lots of environmental justice issues. The classic ones, these are called siting issues, right? Where um, this is one right in our neighborhood in Coconut Grove. Um, I hope as UM students, um, most of us have heard about this story where um, an incinerator was sited in uh, the West Grove, which at the time was a majority and still is today um, a, a, a Bahamian, um, Black Bahamian community, right? One of the first communities actually to be in the region, um, but then when the city of Miami decided that they needed to uh, put an incinerator somewhere, they cited it near this community as opposed to like Coral Gables or some of the other communities nearby, right? So these exist here. When I was part of the environmental justice clinic, oh, just to go back, that's a background picture of when I was in the environmental justice clinic at the University of Miami School of Law, which really tries to address these issues. Um, both broadly, like through policy, administrative law, research, and then uh, more narrowly through um, direct lawyering, direct services, tort law, class actions, things like that. Um, and this is one of the class actions that they were working on. I was working on a different one. And then we also have uh, things like NIMBYism. Uh, this was something that I actually presented at um, the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, where AJ got his master's. And um, I do want to say that while I was there, the protest was on full force. Um, at, at the end of the conference, they had put up boards for people to kind of write their thoughts, and there were all kinds of protests. Students had shown up and written all kinds of uh, protest um, statements, which I, I really enjoyed, right? Because it was an environmental justice conference. And um, you know, if you're not going to uh, directly address the injustices that are going on, then what are we really there for, right? But this is about kind of nimbyism that's happening because of rezoning, because of, um, you know, well, one, it's called opportunity zones are being established along a transit line, but it also happens to coincide very well with the highest sea, um, areas above sea level in Florida because our transit lines are built along a coral rock ridge that are um, that's above sea level. Um, and also though along these, um, this, uh, the railroad line are community, lots of communities of color um, because one, uh, it was redlining that happened in um, our area. Two, because it wasn't seen, it was zoned originally um, under form-based code is not seen as um, attractive to live in, right? So now these communities are being displaced. Um, there's also new developments going up, affordable housing developments, but a lot of times people show up to community, um, to public hearings to kind of poo-poo these affordable housing developments as, 
um, you know, is not wanted in their neighborhoods because they have less density or whatever. So these are kind of some of um, emerging issues that are come, environmental justice issues, but it's still a classic environmental justice issue of nimbyism, not wanting something undesirable in your environment and preferring to put it somewhere else. Um, and then something I was more recently involved in, along with all of these really great uh, local uh, community groups, it was a coalition working on housing and energy justice um, in the area. And we came up with this document, um, Housing Justice in the Face of Climate Change, that uh, kind of tries to address affordable housing um, in the face of climate change and how to make um, access to sustainable, healthy, safe housing, um, basically to everyone in the community, regardless, right, of income or um, of demographics or zip code, right? So, um, uh, oh, this is not, oh, right, so sorry, I put in a fancy, um, fancy uh, animation, I forgot. So uh, another thing even more recently that we're dealing with, um, so we know that like, housing right so how is housing tied to um and people in housing and the built environment tied to the natural environment so that's kind of what um, intersectionality comes in too is trying to um take down that unnatural barrier right between the natural and built environment also as a way to kind of break up um community action right in regards to both right so if you can separate people who are interested in saving nature, right? Nature, what that is, and then people on the other side who are interested in saving uh, people or social justice and view them as completely separate, then we don't really address um, issues where they where there's very clear intersection of those, right? And so one of that is housing as a social determinant of health. Um, and health is very much informed by our environment, whether it's built or natural, right? And so we wanna blend those. And that it, with the, um, with the recent crisis and coronavirus and you're seeing like um you know my, this third article is from the guardian in england so they're seeing similar um uh impacts disparate impacts on minorities right so this isn't just an american thing although we have a unique set of circumstances because of our history of slavery um and things like that but and then you know our um colonization originally with the native americans but this is something global, right? And then also the zip code study, um, more evidence that this is something that's all connected, that if you're born in the environment of Overtown, right? Um, and if you live in Miami, you know that Overtown is a predominantly black community. Um, your mortality is 15 years less than um, someone born in Brickell. And it doesn't matter um, income, whether you adjust for things like that later on, um, this pretty much holds throughout your life, right? So things like this, uh, another emerging kind of environmental justice issue uh, is this um, disparity in access to clean energy, right? So as we're switching to a renewable um, energy economy, um, what happens to people who aren't um, adapted um, to be resilient or adapt, you know, or aren't able to kind of access the, the cleaner energy that um, other, that wealthier uh, communities are, right? Um, and then just to end with uh, this um, slide about science denialism, and maybe this is another uh, reason for scientists to get involved in politics. Um, it's not really being involved in politics. I think it's, it's if you're not, in, not aware of what's going on politically, you're just um, contributing to the selective indifference that allows this kind of injustice to continue. Um, and I really do believe that the, um, when people suffer, the environment suffers and vice versa. And that, you know, that this barrier between the natural and built environment um, is really false. Um, and that, and then I'll leave you with this quote from the danger of a single story and the reason why science, um, law, policy, all of this stuff um, has to kind of intersect to look towards the future. Um, uh, Cause when we realize that there's never a single story about any place, we regain a kind of paradise. Um, so, and I'm sorry, when I was in my shared screen, I couldn't see if anyone was asking questions, even though I said to please pipe in, but I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen now, if I can. Nope, that wasn't it. Um, nope, there we go, okay.
So if there are any questions or comments, um, anything, um, have I stopped sharing my screen or not? I don't think I have. Yeah, you stopped. Okay. So, um, and that's pretty much uh, what I'm working on and what I'm thinking about. <laughs> Teresa, that was awesome. Are there any questions? <laughs> All right, well, today was very powerful. You know, thinking about words like uh, selective indifference, being apolitical, how these are actually political statements. So getting awareness, um, I think these are really great conversations that need to continue, especially beyond Earth Week. Um, so if you guys, oh, there's a question, go ahead. Um, like, uh, so you heard me talk a little bit about administrative law and uh, the tedious process. Administrative law is basically the way we make policy in the United States. Um, and it is definitely um, a long process, but I feel like it's uh, one of the right now within the current system that we have without a kind of complete overturn of the system, right? Um, it's one of the strongest ways to kind of interject and tackle these issues. Um, and then you have something called impact litigation, which is, um, I'm only in law school, so I'm not, you know, qualified to be like, yes, I'm going to do some sort of like um, impact litigation that will um, change these issues. But you could bring, um, you know, so a lot of times like places like the Center for Biological Diversity and these um, organ organizations bring litigation to kind of change the laws of the land, right? So if we start maybe bringing uh, more litigation, looking at equal protection of people in the environment, let's say, or things like that. Um, maybe that would make a, a quicker difference. But now, in law school, they often talk about how law lags, basically. Law lags behind people and behind um, politics and all that kind of stuff. So that's why it's really important to also get involved, you know, preemptively rather than waiting for the law to kind of try and catch up. Oh, uh, you have another question. Uh, so uh, AJ too, I think uh, could probably address this, um, but I think it is really kind of, uh, like I said, I, not one person can do it. It's not about listening to a single story. It's about everybody kind of combining their voices, um, coming together and, and, and doing activism. Um, and stuff like that. Um, and Cancer Alley in Louisiana, yeah, um, I believe they're actually slated to put up uh, more uh, factories and industry in that region, um, plastic, plastic uh, manufacturers. I think there's, um, I read like uh, over a hundred applications to open up um, factories in that area. So yeah, it's, so uh, what Randy's talking about, he asked about Cancer Alley in Louisiana. It's um, basically an area where lots of industry are situated. And so there's high rates of cancer within the populations there. I'd also like to add, um, I love where the arts can intersect with our work. Uh, and there's a really incredible documentary called Mossville which recently came out and I'll send it out to, I sent it out to the info list at Rasmus, but it got bounced back because I guess the people who are monitoring that don't. And so maybe I'll, I'll give it to Kayla and she can forward it out. But basically it's about someone who, a uh, historically black community, it was a Freeman community where it was uh, freed slaves settled there. And basically it got whittled away by all these petrol industrial plants from the outside until there's only one house with one person living in it left. And it's not only like visually stunning, but it's just like incredible story around what happens in Cancer Alley and how communities are literally like erased and removed and a really direct connection of our work as like scientists to like, you know, what's the lived experience of people who live by the plants where we're just asking for less emissions instead of turning the plants off, et cetera. 
Yeah, AJ, if you want to send that over, I can try my hand at that too. Yeah, I'll shoot it to you, yeah. Um, um, I, also, I, I love the first question about like big figures. I totally agree with Teresa, like organizing is really important. Um, I should have talked a little bit about like the victory that we achieved at FES uh, at, at Yale School of Environment, which I didn't, like those banners might have caught, they might have ended friendships. I'm not as popular as I was when I started there. Um, but we got our first indigenous person and our first black person hired as faculty as like almost a direct link to the student activism, right? So it's like sometimes you need to make people upset, but some of the people who will, uh, who were upset will still profit off of the progress, right? Because we all profit off of having a more diverse, more representative academy, so. Yeah, being able to sit down and have uh, what might be uncomfortable conversations for a lot of people is really important and understanding intersection and integrated responses between different values is really important to make transformative changes as we move forward. So uh, with that, I'd really, really like to thank you guys for speaking today and helping out with Earth Week um, and thank everyone for attending. Uh, we have bingo tonight. That's really exciting. <laughs> so there's bingo and um, tomorrow we're going to be talking about climate change and policy a little bit further and a little sip and share tomorrow evening. So thank you everyone. Happy Earth Week. Thank you. Happy Earth Day.